The previous example that we looked at was just a serial job. And if you're just running serial jobs, then uh, with a few exceptions, you are likely able to run those just fine on your local machine. So that means most of our users are looking to do some form of parallelization as the work they want to run uh, generally can't be reasonably run on their local machine. Many scientific software packages and applications are capable of some form of parallelization, and they can take advantage of the avail availability of CPUs on the NISI platforms uh, to increase the runtime of their work. Uh, this can allow them to drastically improve their throughput and performance. What type of parallelization is possible is dependent on the software that you're using, uh, but we'll look at the three main types of parallelization we see on the NACI platforms, those being multi-threading, distributed programming, and independent job arrays, with the last type not technically being parallelization, but it's closely related and used for a similar purpose, so I'll include it in this section. So first up, let's look at multi-threading. Multi-threading is a method of parallelization where a master thread forks into a specified number of slave threads and divides the tasks among them. Uh, these threads run concurrently in a shared memory environment, which allows for communication between the threads via the shared memory. Uh, this means that when using multi-threading alone, you are limited to the amount of CPUs available in a single node, since the CPUs must be in a shared memory environment. So this usually means between uh, either 36 or 40 CPUs on the Nessie platforms, depending on whether the job is on Mahawika or Maui, respectively. But this requirement also has some advantages. First, since it's a shared memory environment, uh, things only need to be written to memory once, uh, which can drastically reduce the overall memory requirements of the job. And it is especially important when your jobs have very large data sets. Uh, and second, uh, multi-threading communication tends to have uh, lower computational overheads, uh, making it generally worthwhile to use multi-threading instead of other forms of parallelization where possible, uh, except with regards to job arrays, which again, as I mentioned, aren't really real parallelization. Um, now let's look at an example of multi-threaded job. For simplicity's sake, the example script is mostly the same as a serial version uh, with one key difference. We are now requesting a specified number of CPUs with the uh, patch directive dash dash CPUs per task. Note that CPUs per task does refer to logical CPUs. So CPUs per task equals four is providing this job with two physical CPUs. Uh, the command that this example is using is also uh, not PWD. Uh, you don't really need to worry about what the command is doing. The only important thing, important thing is that the command is printing the affinity list, which refers to the logical CPUs on the node that this job has access to. As you can see from the output, this job has access to four logical CPUs, 7, 9, 43, and 45. But just because the job has access to multiple CPUs doesn't mean that they are able to be used. Uh, generally, within your script, you'll have to explicitly utilize these extra CPUs. How this is done is dependent on what software you're using. Some software can automatically detect the extra CPUs, and you'll perhaps only have to use special parallel commands, while other softwares, especially more low-level compiled softwares like C, uh, you'll have to explicitly break up and assign your work to CPUs. You'll need to learn how to do this for your chosen software, uh, though we have support pages for many software packages that explains their use. If you are still having trouble, then don't hesitate to contact us and we can see what we can do to help. But while multi-threading alone is great, when your jobs can comfortably fit, run on the CPUs of a single node, or what do you do when your job is still running slow with a full node of CPUs? That is where MPI comes in. MPI stands for Message Passing Interface, and it is a communication protocol for programming across parallel computers. That is across multiple nodes. Utilizing MPI on an SCHPC means you can potentially utilize hundreds or even thousands more CPUs uh, than would otherwise be possible with multi-threading alone, which is fantastic for workloads that are heavily CPU bound. But MP MPI does, come, does not come without costs. First, the communication overheads for MPI tend to be higher than multi-threading. So this means MPI jobs tend to use resources less efficiently. And it is the, and it is the reason why you might want to use MPI in conjunction with the multi-threading, having multi-threading within the nodes and only using MPI across nodes. The other major downside of MPI is that because each node has its own independent mem uh, memory, data must be read into memory for each node at least. And any data required from processes on other nodes must be sent via MPI. This means overall memory requirements of MPI can be much higher than if they were able to be multi-threaded. 
Now let's also take a look at an MPI job. Again, for simplicity, there are only a few differences from our serial example. Uh, first, to specify the number of MPI tasks, we use the dispatch directive dash dash end tasks. Previously, for the multi-thread example, we use dash dash CPU per, CPUs per task, to specify the number of CPUs. The task in CPU per, per task represents the same M MPI task in end tasks, allowing them to be used together. For example, CPUs per task equals four with end tasks equal two would give you two MPI tasks, each with four logical CPUs in a shared memory environment. The MPI tasks though, do not need to be in a shared memory environment. It can instead be spread across nodes communicating via MPI. We've also changed how we are requesting memory. In the previous example, we use dash dash mem to request memory. However, dash dash mem actually refers to memory per node which is fine for the previous examples, which were only running on one node at a time. But with MPI, you can run on multiple nodes. In fact, unless you force a specific number of MPI tasks onto each node, you don't actually know how many MPI tasks could end up on one node. That's where dash dash mem per CPU comes in. By using dash dash mem per CPU, you are essentially saying for each node that this job is on, count how many CPUs I have available on that node and provide uh, the task on that node, X memory for each CPU, where X is the memory per CPU that we've recorded with dash dash mem per CPU. By using dash dash mem per CPU, you no longer have to worry about the large number of tasks falling on a single node and exceeding the memory requested with dash dash mem, causing the job to fail because the memory will be proportionally larger if, the, if more tasks end up on a single node. Finally, when submitting our commands uh, for the job, we also preface all such commands with srun. The srun command essentially says, execute this command on all tasks. If we did not use srun, only the master task would execute the command. But because we did use srun, we can see that in the output, we printed the working directory twice because PWD uh, was run on each of the job's two tasks. Just like with the multi-threading example, how you utilize these extra CPUs in the form of tasks will be dependent on what software you're using. And with some software being straightforward, and merely requiring the use of a few special functions, while others you'll have to be explicit, uh, explicitly write your code to utilize these resources. If you're having trouble figuring out how to do this on your, for your own jobs, then please do check our support pages for the software. And if that doesn't help, then please also contact us. And we are always happy to give you a hand. Finally, let's talk about the last type of parallelization, which I mentioned uh, previously is independent job arrays. In truth, arrays are, as I said, not a form of true parallelization, as each iteration of the array needs to be able to run entirely independent of all other iterations. However, arrays are an extremely useful tool and often used for similar purposes to true parallelization like multi-threading and MPI. So what exactly is an array? To put it simply, an array is a method of submitting multiple iterations of a job without having to rewrite and, re -sub and submit each job individually. They're fantastic for if you're doing things like simulations or permutation analysis, where you just need to submit what is essentially the same job many, many times. Looking at this example, what I want you to understand is that this is in fact just a serial job. Though there is nothing stopping you from using multi-threaded or MPI jobs, uh, the example we're using is a serial job for the sake of simplicity. The only thing that makes this job not a serial job in truth is that we've added this line dash dash array, which essentially says execute this job or submit this job X times, where X is the size of the range you've selected. In this case, the range we chose is one to two. So this job will be submitted to the scheduler two times. But if each, each iteration was doing the exact same thing, this alone is generally not very useful. As we want each, each iteration to do something slightly different. That is where the environment variable that we are echoing back comes in. The Slurm array task ID is what will differentiate each iteration of the array job. Each iteration will receive a different Slurm array task ID uh, with it being one of the numbers in the range that we specified. In this case, one or two. Your script uh, can then read 
the Slamray task ID from the environment and use it as a unique iterator to ensure that each iteration of the array is doing something different. For example, say you have a list of a thousand data sets on which you want to run the same analysis. While you could write something like a for loop in your script, which would one by one run an analysis on each data set, or you could set up an MPI or multi-threaded job to do it, this would mean that you are creating a single very large job, which will take much longer to queue. And if it fails, potentially represents a larger uh, a loss of work than if one iteration of an array job would fail. Instead, you could use an array. Uh, you can set up your array by using the array dash dash array one to 1000. And inside your script, you would say something like, run the analysis on the nth data set of my list, where n is the Slurm array task ID in the environment. Array dash one to a thousand will create a thousand iterations of the job, and each of those jobs will have a different slum array task ID from one to one thousand. So each iteration will run an analysis on a single uh, item uh, in your unique list, a single one of those data sets. And that data set will only be run once. The major benefit of running your job this way is that each iteration is essentially treated by the queue as its own job. So rather than having one big job, which needs to wait for all the resources to free up at once, you have many smaller jobs, which can fit in spaces left over by other jobs, uh, since each can be run independently and require much less resources. That means you will generally get through the queue uh, with your work much faster if you're using array jobs. Now, I have mentioned logical and physical CPUs previously in this talk, but I haven't really explained exactly what, I, what they mean other than to say that each physical CPU has two logical CPUs, or is two logical CPUs, I should say. This difference comes down to something called hyperthreading being enabled on our platforms. Hyperthreading can be quite a confusing topic. So I think the easiest way to explain it is with an example. So imagine that you have a dual CPU core computer. If you wanted to run a multi-thread job on that computer, you would usually assign one thread to each CPU. So in this example, you would have two th a two-thread job with one thread on each of the two CPUs. But the thing about multi-threading is that the threads can stall. There are many reasons why this happens. Maybe the thread is waiting on something to be written to memory, or maybe the thread is waiting on the output of one of the other threads. But regardless of the reason, sometimes the thread stalls. And if a thread stalls, then that means the CPU the thread is sitting on is idle, which represents wasted CPU time. One way around this problem of wasted CPU time from stored threads is that you can oversubscribe CPUs. That is, you can assign a greater number of threads to a fewer number of CPUs. So instead of assigning two threads to two CPUs, we could instead assign four threads to our two CPUs. Now, when one of the threads that are running stalls, rather than the CPU being idle, it can kick off the stalled thread and start running one of the other unassigned threads. This will effectively eliminate the CPU idle time. However, this does not come without costs. Kicking a thread off and loading a new thread on has computational overheads. This coupled with the fact that the CPU has no way of knowing how long the stalled thread will be stalled for means that if you have short enough and regular enough stall times, you can actually have your job start to wait, be wasting more time switching between threads than would have been saved or would have been wasted if the stalled thread had run its course. That is where hyperthreading comes in. The CPU on the Nessie platform, CPUs on the Nessie platforms are hyperthreaded. And what that means is that for each CPU, there are two hardware threads rather than the standard one hardware thread of a normal CPU. Now, having two hardware threads does not mean the CPU can do twice as many calculations because that is work done by the CPU itself, not by the hardware threads. What having two hardware threads means is that a CPU can have two threads loaded onto it at once. It can still only do the calculations of one of those threads. But now when the running thread stalls, rather than kicking off the thread and loading a new thread on, it can just switch to the other hardware thread. And while the switching between the hardware threads is not free, it is a much, much lower computational overhead than kicking a thread off and loading a new thread on. This means that you can get the benefits of oversubscribing CPUs and significantly reduce the downsides. 
But the thing is that Slurm doesn't understand hyperthreading. To get it to work on Slurm, you essentially have to trick it. And the way you do that is that you say the hardware thread is a CPU, allowing you to assign threads to it. But this has knock-on effects, where Slurm now thinks that hardware threads are CPUs throughout the entire system. So when you use something like memory per CPU or CPU per task, Slurm is referring to hardware threads rather than in real physical CPUs. So a logical CPU is a hardware thread, while a physical CPU is an actual CPU. Now you can disable hyperthreading with the s directive tint dash dash tint equals null multithread. And we do advise that you test your jobs both with and without hyperthreading to determine what is the best for your work. However, if you do disable hyperthreading, please do be aware that CPUs per task will start referring to physical CPUs rather than logical CPUs, as it does when hyperthreading is enabled. But mem per CPU will always refer to logical CPUs or hardware threads, regardless of whether hyperthreading is disabled. <laughs> 